So a, a story came to mind this week. I, I, I'm afraid I may have shared this story before, but my 60-year-old brain can't remember if I've shared it or not, but I'm going to share it anyway. Uh, and uh, some of you I know who are my friends have heard the story, but uh, very briefly, a number of years ago, uh, uh, my family and I, we were traveling in upstate New York, and we were visiting some friends uh, that we'd made while we lived there for seven years. And on one particular day, it just poured rain. It rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. So much so that creek beds rapidly filled up and little tiny waterfalls turned into Niagara Falls. It was just astonishing. And so because of that, Peter and I, along with uh, my good friend Mark, we wanted to see how big an established waterfall had become because of all the rain. And so we drove on a backcountry road and we got to the side and we pulled over and walked down this little trail and we stood and looked at the waterfall and it was absolutely massive. It was huge. And it roared, as did the rapids below the falls. Uh, and it was then that our, our son Peter saw a little small trail that kind of went down the hill and then across the hill and made its way behind the waterfall and he decided he wanted to get behind the waterfall. I said, sure, Peter, just be very careful, please. So he made his way down the trail and got behind the waterfall, gave us a thumbs up. And then I got this really insane idea. I thought, well, if Peter thinks that's great and it's a good view, maybe I should go join him behind the waterfall. And my friend Mark said, Robert, I think you're insane. So anyway, I took just one step, and then it happened. The path due to being waterlogged gave out. And I had a quick decision to make as I began to fall. I saw a tree, and so I leapt for the massive tree. I bounced off the trunk. <laughs> I then began to slide down the hill, which is really more of a cliff toward the roaring rapids below. I flail this way and that, grabbing at anything I could reach. Branches, bushes, rocks, all became fair game to try and hold on to. And when I got closer and closer and closer to the rapids, my panic increased. What do I grab a hold of now? I yelled out. Before I knew it, I was at the bottom of the cliff with the branches of a huge, within the branches of a huge bush that stood right at the water's edge. It saved me and probably my life. Sadly, my scheduled parachute jump the next day with friends had to be canceled because I was too banged up and hurt. Well, anyway, this story likely came to mind this week because of some of the feelings I felt as I was rolling down the cliff echo some of what I've been feeling now. With so much uncertainty and not knowing where a lot of things are headed, I've spent a lot of time wondering, what the heck should I hold, grab a hold of now? You know, I know there's lots of pain and loss and worry and upset. I need not to review how many of us are feeling. We all know the feelings well. But as we tumble toward the unknown together, I guess I have to ask once again today and invite each of you to ask, what do we grab a hold of now? What do we grab a hold of now? And I think as people of faith, the answer is palpably clear. What I think we need to do is I think we need to grab a hold of Jesus like never before. And if we already are feeling close to Jesus, I believe it's time to get even closer. Not just to hold on to the fringe of his cloak, but to wrap our arms around him as tight as we can. And if indeed this is the case, the questions become now, why should we move closer to God with intention now, and how do we do it? Well, the first part, why? Why grab onto Jesus? Why be more intentional now about a relationship than ever before? Well, that could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but here's just a few thoughts. When we intentionally move toward God, when we, when we grab onto Jesus, we encounter a love like no other. A love that will change us completely from the inside out. When we grab onto Jesus, I need to be clear, it doesn't mean success by cultural standards. It doesn't mean a full bank account. It doesn't mean no problems or no challenges or pains or heartache or everything will be just fine and dandy. Rather, when we grab onto Jesus, our lives become infused from the inside out with the most priceless thing there is, and that is love, a love that will change everything, a love that is with us now and for eternity. 
And when we grab onto Jesus with all of our vigor and intent, our perspectives about things change. Our, our perspectives of problems change. How we see the massive challenges that we're all faced with right now will fundamentally be different. When we grab onto Jesus and intentionally move closer to God, how we approach our pain, our heartache, our hurt, and how we deal with forgiveness all changes. It affects how we respond to success and what we do with it. When we grab onto Jesus, we discover a hope like no other, a path like no other, a way forward that no other way offers. It changes how we treat every person we know. It changes how we treat ourselves. When we grab onto Jesus, when we move closer to God, we open our hearts to profound feelings and emotions, to a vulnerability we may not have known before, to a tender way of living and thinking. And when we grab onto Jesus and move closer to God, we encounter healing, freedom, and a loosening of the grip of fear. When we hold on to Jesus, we will discover that we have a ticket to heaven in our pocket, a ticket we don't have to earn, a ticket we don't have to work toward, but a ticket that's been there all along, whether or not we've known it. And perhaps best of all, when we grab onto Jesus, quickly we will discover that it is Jesus that is actually grabbing a hold of us. Because Jesus knows that ultimately we live in this life, and in this life we can only hold on to him imperfectly. We're human, which is why Jesus will never let go of you or me. So this is just for starters as to why at this time, with all this uncertainty, as we roll down a cliff, the most important thing we can do right now is spend most of our energy moving closer to God and grabbing tighter and tighter hold of Jesus. So knowing a bit of why to hold on and move closer to God, the question is, how do we do so? How do we help ourselves move closer to God? This is a huge topic. It's a lifelong journey. I have hundreds of thoughts. But today I just want to share a few. The bottom line is I think we help ourselves grab on Jesus more tightly. We move closer to God when we pay attention to our perspectives about our faith life. When we turn into and actually learn to use our suffering in a new way. And when we manage our priorities. And I'd like for a few moments to take a look at each of these three in turn. When we really want to move closer to God, it helps immensely if we have a particular perspective about what faith is about to begin with. And this perspective is well described in a book that many of us are reading at the chapel in a book study written by Brennan Manning titled The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus. Now, in the book, Brennan suggests that there are two basic ways we can approach or we can see our relationship with God. One is as a settler. The other is as a pioneer. And truth be told, I believe there's a bit of a settler and a bit of a pioneer in all of us. But to help us explore these two ways of looking at, our, at God and our faith, Brennan uses a metaphor of the Old West, settlers and pioneers. Now let's look at the settler way of approaching our Lord. When we seek to be a settler in our relationship with God, our ultimate goal is to arrive at a place with lots of knowns and lots of certainty, to have answers to questions, to have clarity, to have security. And when we approach our relationship with God as a settler, the church, if you will, becomes a courthouse, a courthouse where records are kept and trials are held. Faith is about law and order and black and white and clarity. And when we approach our faith as a settler, God becomes the mayor of the town we live in. Peace and quiet and order are God's main concerns. The mayor lives in the top of the courthouse, observing the tiniest details of life below. When we approach our faith as a settler, Jesus becomes the sheriff in town. The sheriff is around to enforce all the rules, and the sheriff spends time looking for bad guys and those who commit misdeeds or somehow 
fall short. Brandon Manning writes that the sheriff, when we were a settler, wears a white hat, only drinks milk, and decides who gets thrown into jail. And when we approach faith as a settler, the Holy Spirit becomes the saloon girl, and her job is to offer comfort. She tells people that everything will be okay. And she tells the sheriff when she sees someone doing something wrong. Now in this scenario, the Christian is a settler in the town who is afraid of the unknown and looks for ways to stay on good terms with the mayor and to stay out of the way of the sheriff. When we approach our faith as a settler, clergy become the bankers. They keep everything locked down tight. Faith is all about safety and security and obeying the laws and measuring up. Conversely, another way to approach our faith journey is as a pioneer. And when we approach our faith as a pioneer, the church is not a courthouse, but a covered wagon. The covered wagon is where, as Brandon Menning writes, where pioneers eat, sleep, fight, love, and die. The wagon is always on the move into the future. It's not about remaining in one place. It's always headed somewhere. And sometimes the path is pretty smooth. And other times it's rough as hell. When we approach faith as a pioneer, God becomes our trail boss. The trail boss lives and eats and sleeps and engages with his people. And the people's well-being is the trail boss's main concern. And without the trail boss, the wagon does not move. And the trail boss, in fact, gets into the mud with the people when the wagon gets stuck. We approach faith as a pioneer. Jesus becomes a scout. He goes ahead of the people, ahead of us, to lay out a path for us. He suffers hardship and reveals day in and day out what the trail boss wants. And by looking at the scout, the people learn what it means to be a pioneer. As a pioneer, the Holy Spirit becomes a buffalo hunter. The buffalo hunter provides what the people need. He's kind of a wild man, and no one knows what on earth the buffalo hunter is going to do next. But that's okay. And when we approach faith as a pioneer, clergy become cooks. They serve up what the buffalo hunter provides, never confusing their roles with the trail boss, scout, or buffalo hunter. Living as a pioneer is all about adventure, pushing out into the unknown. The life journey is one that unfolds, and there is a lack of clarity, a lack of uncertainty, or there's uncertainty. There's not complete security along the way. But pioneers know they will never be separated from the trail boss, the scout, or the buffalo hunter, regardless of how tough things are. Faith is a settler. Faith is a pioneer. I think there's likely a little of each of us in each of these descriptions. After all, most of us like at least some security, certainty, and clear answers, don't we? But I believe if we first and foremost seek security, and certainty as we approach faith as a settler, we may struggle more than others with crises, and we may, in fact, make it harder to see what God is trying to do in our lives through the uncertainty. Faith is a journey, not a place of arrival. And like being in a covered wagon, God seeks to transform and change and move us from one place to another, even in the bad times. God is seeking to move us and change us and transform us in this time to become more like Christ, to get closer to God. And when we live as a pioneer, rather than trying to grab a hold of security and certainty, we instead grab a hold of Jesus. We embrace movement and change and transformation. And we let go and learn to let go of much, which makes more room for Jesus in our lives. And when we live as a pioneer, Jesus begins to replace our need for certainty, clarity, and knowing what is ahead. Trust replaces fear of the unknown. And that's something we all need right now. Two other things that can help us move closer to God, and these are much shorter in description. 
but I've been thinking about this a lot, and that is if we learn to use our suffering, it can move us closer to God. Now, sometimes all of us are in such great pain that we're incapacitated for a while. And in the short term, it's okay to stay in that place of being incapacitated by it. But over time, I think we can make a choice to simply take the pain we are in, or we can choose to use the pain we're in. And when we use our pain and learn to use it, we in fact get closer to Jesus. In life, when two people endure something together, yes, it can pull them apart, but it can also make them closer than ever before. Jesus suffered. We suffered. The shared pain can bring us closer to Jesus if we allow it. As one person writes, all of our mental anguish, tension, the contradictions we meet with, the betrayal we experience, the abandonment, the pain of it all, all of it can join us to Christ because Christ suffered. None of this means we're to say, gee, I am so glad I'm hurting, it's making me closer to God. Of course not. Nor does it mean that God wants us to hurt. Of course not. But what it does mean is that our suffering can in fact lead to good. It can tie us to Jesus. It can prompt us to reach out to God. It can move us to want to be closer to God. And there is more. Jesus, as we heard in our reading today, said, take up your cross and follow me. In other words, Jesus invites us to follow him in the midst of our hurt, struggles, imperfections, pain, and suffering. We don't need to leave it behind to follow. We're supposed to bring it along and follow. And when we bring it along, all of our stuff can make us empathic, compassionate, understanding of the hurt of others, lead us to being more vulnerable with others, and tender and caring. And when we take and use our pain in this way, we become more and more like Christ, and we get much closer. And the closer we get, the easier it is to hold on. The bottom line, I think this time invites us to think about using our pain to make us more Christ-like and to draw us closer to God in Jesus' suffering that he shares with us. Well, aside from a pioneer spirit and suffering which can be passed through which we get closer to God, there's just one more thing briefly I want to mention. And perhaps it's obvious, but day to day, whether they are known or not, we move toward and get closer with those things that we prioritize. We get closer to our priorities than to things we don't have much interest in. And in the midst of our shared exhaustion of these days and fatigue over one crisis after another, we only have so much energy, bandwidth, and time. Our lives will reflect whatever priorities we have, and we will be closest to whatever is our number one priority. Now, in my life, of course, my wife, Regina, my children, my friends, my vocation, all of you, the chapel family, is where my attention and love is focused. But I know that I cannot make it one day without Jesus by my side. I just can't, nor would I want to. And I believe the more that each of us makes our relationship with Christ our number one priority, not only will it change everything, but it will move us closer to God like never before. When Jesus fills that number one spot, there still will be pain. We may not always know where the covered wagon is headed, there will be joy and good and struggles. But if we work day in and day out, putting Jesus in that number one spot, however imperfectly we do so, it'll put us in the position to grab a hold of him when we're falling down a cliff. A pioneer spirit, using our pain, making Christ our number one priority. All important things for us to ponder and explore as we move forward through these tough days together. And I want to close with this. If many of you have read The Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens wrote it, and his words fit, I think, where we are now perfectly. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. 
It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the season of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. I believe these words are very appropriate for us today. It is the worst of times. I need not explain why. But it's also the best of times, specifically because God is asking you and me and inviting us to get closer to Jesus than we have ever, ever been before. And we can use these worst of days to more powerfully become the presence of Christ wherever we find ourselves. And we can use this time, finally, to discover perhaps, like never before, that when it's all said and done, God's love is all that really matters when it's said and done. And let us pray.